Well, let us look for a few moments together at Colossians 1, uh, verses 9 through 14. We come this morning to to a passage that is a a, a bit of a change from what we were looking at a a couple of weeks ago uh, in the first eight verses of this letter. We noted uh, when we looked at those verses um, uh, that Paul began this letter with a distinctly uh, tender approach. You remember this is a congregation that is being troubled by false teachers. Uh, We're uncertain, really, of of where they have come from. We're uncertain, really, as to the extent of the damage that they've been able to do. And and we're uncertain even as to the content of what they are teaching. But what we do know is that they were undermining the confidence of this congregation in the full sufficiency of Jesus Christ for the the blessing of, of God. And in in those first eight verses, Paul has opened this letter with a distinctly pastoral uh, approach, a tender approach, reminding his readers of all that they have received by virtue of their faith in Christ. He has reassured them that far from needing to, to add to the work of Jesus, they have already been abundantly blessed by God through their union with Christ by faith. And now Paul turns and he continues in a tender tone, but rather than reassuring them or or, or reiterating what perhaps Epaphras has taught them, now Paul turns to teach to tell them how it is that he is praying uh, for them. And the essence of his prayer for them is that they would come to the fullness of Christian maturity. Now it's been said that at the root of every heresy is a true doctrine that has been focused on to the exclusion of all others. That at the root of every heresy there's a true doctrine that has been focused on to the exclusion of all others. That is to say that every heresy has at its core a truth, but one that has been so ripped from its context that it has become disfigured and has actually began to lead people away from that central truth. Right, and we can see, I think, fairly easily how that was the case in Colossae. You remember from our introduction to this book, and as we've just said, it's exceedingly difficult to know the exact nature of what was going on in Colossae. Paul talks about it and talks about those who propagated it in such general terms that it's hard to nail down the specifics. But what is clear is that these false teachers were telling the Colossians that they were not yet spiritually mature and that they needed to do something to bring their salvation to its completion. And that, as Paul makes clear here, as he tells his readers how he's praying for them, that is not entirely false. And in fact, in Philippians 3, verses 8 through 15, Paul writes about the continuing need to press on to Christian maturity. Turn with me there in your Bibles, if you would. Philippians 3, picking up at verse 8. The Apostle writes these words. He says, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. 
Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. But you hear what Paul's saying there to the, to the Philippians. He's saying that a, a mark, of Christian, un, uh, of Christian maturity is, in a sense, an understanding that we have not yet attained Christian maturity. And so we press on. And the word that's translated in our English Bibles there, press on, is a word that means follow after or even persecute. It's the word that Jesus, that is used in, in Matthew 5, at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus talks about his disciples being persecuted. It's the word that Paul uses in Philippians 3, just before the passage we read in verse 6, where he's describing his past life before his conversion, and he's describing his own persecution of Christ's church. When he talks about his his going from place to place and, and outdoing all others in the persecution of the church. It's the same word that he's using. And so when he goes on and talks about that in the pursuit of Christian maturity, what he is driving into his readers is that this must be a determined search. Right? This is to be an intensely purposeful seeking after this Christian maturity. It's to be effort. It's to be intentional. And so, the false teachers in Colossae were not entirely wrong to tell these young Christians that they must put in an effort to grow up into the fullness of their salvation. That these false teachers were not entirely wrong to tell these young Christians that they must, that they must press on towards this Christian maturity. The problem was the way that they proposed this be done. Right, later on, we will see in this letter that they propose that the way to do it is through asceticism, through submitting the body to severe disciplines. Paul caricatures it, he characterizes it, he distills it down in chapter 2, verse 21, down to do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. They were saying the way to get to Christian maturity is to deprive the body. It is to, it is to, it is to not handle certain things. It's to not taste certain foods. It's to not touch certain things. They are advocating the way to do it is through asceticism, but also through the observance of external rituals. Paul will describe the, the myriad of, of, of festivals and rites that these false teachers seem to be uh, uh, advocating as if doing the right thing in the right way at the right time would yield that right result. We could say, if we're being generous, that in Colossae, these false teachers, these spiritual physicians, if we could call them that, had diagnosed the correct disease, but their prescription was killing the patient. Rather than leading them on to spiritual strength, what they were advocating was only leading to the eventual spiritual death of those who went after them. And so here, as Paul recounts how he prays for these young Christians, his prayer is not simply that, he will, that they will grasp what he has outlined in the first eight verses and then put their feet up. It's not that they will get their minds around the fullness and the riches of the salvation that they have received through their faith in Christ and then just let go and let God. Just declare once saved, always saved, and then coast to the end. You know, what Paul says here is that his prayer for them, his, verse 9, his, his unceasing prayer for them, is that they may be filled with the knowledge of the will of God in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. In a sense, that's a, a recap of the first eight verses. 
But then he brings in the purpose. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That is to say that Paul's prayer for them is that they would grasp the enormity of the riches that they have received in Christ. And they would press on in the pursuit of Christian maturity. That there was a deficiency in these Colossian Christians. That there, there is a deficiency in every Christian, the side of glory. There is something lacking in us. There is in in all of us a spiritual immaturity that needs to be addressed and and fought against. Whenever we are converted, we bring a whole host of wrong ideas with us into the church, into our new life in Christ. Maybe we can illustrate it this way. During the Reformation especially the Continental Reformation, you had these epic moments where reform doctrine would spread and the the German elector would become convinced of the reformed cause. And he would declare that in all his territories, the Protestant faith must now be propagated. Overnight, every church in his jurisdiction was suddenly Protestant. Now who was going to lead the worship service on the next Lord's Day. It's the same man who the week before was a Roman Catholic priest. The church was Protestant, but the man leading the services was still bringing in a whole host of Roman Catholic training and doctrine and and ideology. It's one of the reasons why books of common prayer became so important during the Reformation. How do you get that man to lead a Protestant service? You make sure he reads from a, a script. But the point is that the, the theology had changed and the infrastructure remained. And, and there's a certain sense in which that is analogous to what happens when we're converted. When we come to a knowledge of Christ, our chains fall off, our hearts are free, we go, we go forth and, and we rise, go forth and, and follow Christ. But the next day, as we go into work, or as we switch on our computers, or as we just go out into the world, our ethics may be functionally exactly the same as they were the day before. Our temptations may be just as strong as they were the day before, maybe even more so. There's still a lot about us that must change, that must be conformed to the new life in the kingdom of Christ. But you understand, this is a process that goes on throughout our entire lives. Our our justification is an event, but our sanctification is a process. Our justification is instantaneous. The minute that, that you repent and believe the gospel, and you are justified and you are, you are reconciled to God and you are lavished with all the spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus as we saw in Ephesians 1 a couple of weeks ago. But sanctification, that will take an entire lifetime. Right? Whenever we put our faith in Christ, we are declared to be, as Paul says in chapter 1 verse 2, saints, we are We are declared to be holy ones. We are set apart by God as His chosen people. But it will take a lifetime to bring our hearts and our minds into conformity with that new reality. We will constantly have to be putting away the old life. We will constantly be having to pursue the new life. And so Paul tells the Colossians that's how he's praying for them. That they would press on into the spiritual maturity. That they would put in the, in the effort, that they would actively and earnestly pursue the knowledge of the will of God. That they would gain spiritual wisdom and understanding. And that they would then manifest, that, that that would all manifest itself in a whole character of life. That's what the word walk means in verse 10. 
But you understand, you see this Old Testament and New Testament. Walk is, that word walk is referring to the trajectory of your life. That's Paul's aim here. As he's praying for them. That they would press on, that they would lean into this, that they would pursue this, their growth in Christian maturity so that their whole character of, of life would be marked by their union with Christ. And that really must be our primary prayer for one another. Is that how you pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ? It's good and it's right that we pray for each other's health. It's good and, and right that we pray for each other's job situation or, or, or issues that have come up in each other's families. Right? It's, it's important to remember these things in prayer. It's good and right that we lift all areas, even the minutia of our lives, up to God in prayer. Right? It's simply part of obeying Christ's command to pray for our daily bread. That constant consciousness that everything we have or need comes from the good hands of God. It's that present awareness of ours and one another's constant dependence upon God. But here Paul challenges us to pray for something deeper for one another. He challenges us to pray for each other that we would not be spiritually lethargic or grow spiritually lazy. He, he challenges us to pray for one another that we wouldn't just take our salvation for granted. Or maybe more common, that we wouldn't decide that we've come far enough. That we don't, that, that we are okay just hanging out in the middle ground of mediocrity. Paul says, no, no, pray for one another. This is how he's praying for the Colossians. And he holds us up as a model prayer for Christ's church. And in doing so, he challenges us to pray for one another. That we would pursue lives that are wholly conformed to the radical transformation that we have received in our redemption. He challenges us to pray for one another. That our minds would be changed. That our hearts would be increasingly conformed to the heart of God. And that we would live lives that are marked increasingly by this incredible redemption that we have received. That we would pray for one another. That we would grow up in our faith. That we would attain spiritual maturity. And that we would each look more and more like Christ, our elder brother. But notice, this isn't going to be easy. That's something evident in verse 11, where Paul says that he prays, May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. Why do you pray for someone to be strengthened? Only because there's a threat that their weakness will overcome them and they will fall short. Why do you pray that someone will have endurance and patience? It's because there's a danger that they will grow weary and decide that the rigors of discipleship are too much and they will fall out of the race. That's the imagery that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 9, isn't it? Verse 24, he says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run? but only one receives the prize, so run that you may obtain it. It's an exhortation to not give up, but to press on, to, to run that you might obtain it. He continues on that same passage, verse 25, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an, un, an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly, he says. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after, reaching, after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. It's that active pressing on. It's that active following after, that 
that, that seeking after that prize with that, that persecuting power, zeal. That's what he's praying here, Colossians 1, that they would run, that they would not run aimlessly, but they would have their eyes fixed on that finishing line and that they would run hard after it. And what is the finishing line? Well, we see it at the end of verse 12. It is the inheritance of the saints in light. And what is that? Well, verse 13, it is the kingdom of God's beloved Son. We press on, we run, we endure with patience and joy, with our eyes fixed on the prize. That is to say that we press on with our eyes fixed on all that will be ours when Christ returns and ushers in his kingdom in all of its fullness. Now, some of you know that I, I run, really jog, I think is probably a better term for it. But sometimes I'm asked if I enjoy running. And I can honestly say that I do not enjoy running. But I enjoy having run. I love that feeling when I come home. I guess it's the endorphins or, or whatever. And in the moment during the run, I rarely hit that that mythical runner's high. For most of my runs, especially in the summer, the thought that is constantly running through my head is this is miserable and awful and I just need to stop and I don't know why I'm doing this. But once I'm finished, once I get home, once I enter into my rest, after that exhortation, after that endurance, my joy is enormous. I hate running, but I love having run. And I think that's what Paul says here. There are going to be times when running the Christian life, when just maybe even if we scale it back and say walking the Christian walk, it's going to be hard and painful. We'll struggle with temptation. We'll battle against besetting sins. And we will, and I think increasingly so, if current trends continue, we will find ourselves marginalized and opposed for our commitment to Christ. It's going to be hard. It's going to be wearisome. We're going to grow fatigued. And so we need to keep our eyes fixed on that finishing line, knowing that while we may run this life, thinking at times, or maybe for some of us, thinking almost every step of the way, this is hard and I just want it to stop. Paul says we need to run with our eyes on that finishing line, knowing that while the running itself might not always be enjoyable, when we enter into our rest at the end of that run, we will enter into something that is glorious and abundant. What awaits for us when we enter into that kingdom finally and fully free, from the domain of darkness, no longer subject to the temptations of the world and the flesh of the devil. What awaits us there is what David describes in Psalm 23. On the other side of this present valley of the shadow of death, he says there is a table prepared for us where we will sit, where our heads will be anointed with with oil, an image of being an honored guest at this feast. Our cups will overflow Oh, and being freed from these present travails and temptations, we will simply rest in the goodness and the mercy that is found in the house of the Lord. So pray that for one another. Pray that God would give us this endurance. Pray that we would be so captivated with the riches of our salvation, that we would be so full of anticipation of that coming finishing line where we will obtain the outcome of our faith. Pray that your brothers and sisters would be strengthened in the race. That they would not give up. That they wouldn't cry uncle. But that they would be able to keep putting one foot in front of the other with endurance, with patience. Even, he says here, even with joy, though not always happiness, But joy rooted in anticipation. Pray that your brothers and sisters would press on 
in their active pursuit of that end. But in the grace of God, we don't just have the promise of a coming feast to drive us on in our race. If I can belabor the running illustration just a little further, God gives us, as it were, an aid station to help us on our way. When our race is complete, we will sit and we will feast. But to energize us in the race, God has given us a little taste of what is coming. And he gives us that here in the Lord's Supper. In Mark 14, verses 22 2 through 25, we're told about the institution of the Lord's Supper. Mark says, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. As Jesus was preparing his disciples for his departure, he gave them this gift of his grace, this memorial meal, which he commanded his disciples to come back to time and again to remember him. But notice how he concluded. He said, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying to us, this is a temporary ordinance. This is given to sustain us in the meantime between his ascension and his return. When he returns, we will sit down at that banquet table. We will come, as Revelation 19 tells us, to the marriage supper of the Lamb. There is a day coming when these little pieces of bread, these tiny cups, will be replaced by a sumptuous repast laid out before us but in the meantime we have this spiritual aid station this lord's supper where we come and we eat and drink in remembrance of christ that's really the key to all that paul has been saying here the diagnosis of the false teachers is not wrong The Colossians did need to grow up in their faith. And they did need to manifest their faith more in the outworking of that faith in their lives. But the solution was not to do more. It was to be captivated more by Jesus and all that God has done for us in him. It's that, that active feeding on Christ by faith that will bring us safe. To the end, that's what Paul says in verse 9. He prays that they may be filled so as to be able to walk. It's what he says in verse 12. That a key, key component of all this is giving thanks. If we are to grow in our Christianity, if we are to mature in our faith, then we are to be captivated by the gospel. And only then will we be driven on to the pursuit of spiritual maturity it's what the author of hebrews wrote in hebrews 12 when he said let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith growth in christian maturity is not about doing more than jesus somehow adding to what he has done for us It is grasping more and more firmly just what it is that he has done for us and how that totally and utterly transforms us. And so as we come to the Lord's table this morning, we come looking to Jesus. We come to contemplate again in this broken bread and this poured out cup, the sacrifice that made it all possible. We come to remember That we are who we are and we have what we have. All because Jesus willingly died in our place. 
bearing the curse of God against our sin. His body broken, his blood spilt, that we might be redeemed and set free and welcomed into this glorious kingdom of heaven. If you are here this morning and you do not yet know Christ, or if you know of some sin in your life that you are not confessing to God and seeking repentance for, then we ask that you would just let the elements pass you by as they are served. In 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul warned that for you to eat and drink would be for you to eat and drink judgment upon yourselves. What we are about to do is a profession of our active faith in Christ. And for you to eat and drink would be for you to say something publicly that is neither true of you nor of Christ. But let it be the last time that you are an onlooker here. The invitation of the gospel is extended to you. Give up your sin. Come to Christ. With us set your minds and your hearts on him. And enjoy with us the riches that are ours, simply by faith in him. Let us pray.